After the end of the Clone Wars, the corporate factions of the Separatist Council that had bankrolled the droid army were nationalized by the Empire, and all of them were liquidated. All of them, that is, except one, the intergalactic banking clan. Not even the all-powerful Empire could get rid of the IGBC. They could attempt to control the banks to nationalize them and strip away some of their assets, but not even they could completely crush their power. The IGBC had become so ingrained in the galactic economy that they had virtually become the economy and no galactic power could hope to succeed without a degree of support from them. This put the IGBC in a position of incredible power and during the Clone Wars, they had exploited from this power for massive amounts of profit. To a degree, they controlled both sides of the war and in this video, we'll be discussing how. Attention, Sergeant on deck! The intergalactic banking clan was the brainchild of the Muns, a species of tall, pale humanoids from Munilinst. Their homeworld was blessed with extraordinary mineral wealth. Its oceans were dotted with smokers that spewed out invaluable metals from the planet's core, creating literal mountains of wealth for the Muns to exploit. When the Muns came into contact with the Republic early in the galactic government's history, they used their wealth to finance exploration and colonization of the Rim. The mechanisms by which they did so eventually consolidated into the IGBC, which took over many other banks in the core worlds, the famous Bank of Argal among them. Between Mun's sponsored colonization efforts, exploitation of Munilinst mineral resources, and the steady assimilation of all other major banking firms, the IGBC eventually developed a monopoly on banking in the Republic. They were able to do this in no small part because, for most of Republic history, Munilinst lay far beyond the Republic's frontier, meaning that the IGBC was able to stay out of virtually every major conflict of the Old Republic era up until the New Sith Wars. This meant that, by the start of the Republic's Golden Age, the IGBC was the most powerful private institution in the galaxy. During the Golden Age of the Republic, the region of space in which Munilinst was located was finally explored, and the IGBC grew even more powerful by buying up the loyalties of newly established colonies near Moon space. It would lend aid to poor, sanctioned Outer Rim worlds like Kaylee in exchange for political capital or the services of their leaders. Those worlds that refused IGBC assistance or failed to repay their debts were subjected to harsh debt collection operations carried out by the IGBC's private army, a joint force of Iotran foot soldiers and battle droids. Such a powerful and completely unaccountable organization naturally attracted the attention of the Sith. The Sith had a hand in the IGBC's internal affairs as early as the reign of Darth Tenebris, whose sponsorship helped Kar Damask become IGBC chairman. In exchange for this favor, Damask married a woman of Tenebris's choosing, and as Tenebris calculated, the two of them produced a son who was extremely strong in the force. Tenebris claimed the boy as his apprentice, naming him Darth Plagueis. When Kar Damask died, Plagueis and the Sith Order by extension inherited a massive amount of wealth and political capital. Due to his heritage, Darth Plagueis was pretty thoroughly entwined with the IGBC in his day-to-day -day guise as Hego Damask. He always had the ear of the banking clan's new chairman, La Shil, and he tutored Hill's son and successor, Sandhill. As Plagueis and his apprentice, Darth Sidious, began laying plans for the Clone Wars, they counted the IGBC among their most important pawns. They manipulated the IGBC into essentially financing the whole war. Thanks to Plagueis' manipulations, the IGBC made the initial payment for the Grand Army of the Republic on Cypher Dias' behalf, and it also financed all of the weapons manufacturers that would go on to play a major role in the Clone Wars. When Darth Sidious killed his master and took over the plan, he lost Plagueis' connections with IGBC leadership, but he was able to retain a degree of control over the clan through his new apprentice, Count Dooku. In the lead up to the Separatist Crisis, Dooku easily got the banking clan on board with supporting the CIS, dazzling them with promises of a new government that wouldn't even dream of economic regulation. When Dooku announced the formation of the CIS and systems started seceding from the Republic, the IGBC officially remained neutral. However, it did alter its rules to make it significantly easier for systems to create their new currencies, providing a massive boost to the separatist movement by allowing the CIS and its new coalition of independent systems 
to break away from the Republic credit standard. By 22 BBY, the IGBC was creating new currencies at an average rate of 20 per day, and that even went so far as to offer a financial bonus to the next 500 approved registrant systems. Officially, the IGBC was neutral in the separatist crisis, but in practice, it was virtually the sole financier of the separatist movement. After the outbreak of the Clone Wars, the IGBC pretty much threw its lot in with the CIS. Mutalinst and Maigido seceded, Sand Hill took a seat on the Separatist Council, and the IGBC's private army became part of the CIS military. But even then, the IGBC, especially its Scipio and Argyle branches, kept up its charade of neutrality. The Republic had no choice to pretend it didn't notice the banking clan's obvious separatist sympathies because they were still reliant on IGBC banking for the credit standard and were paying for clone army reinforcements with IGBC loans. We saw a little of this in Season 6 of Star Wars The Clone Wars, but that was only really the tip of the iceberg when it came to the banking clan's influence over the Clone Wars. The IGBC paid for every clone trooper or battle droid that fought on the front lines, for every blaster that was fired, for every warship that saw action. They loaned exorbitant amounts of credits to the Republic and Confederacy alike, and those loans gave them control over both sides. The IGBC tried the same debt trap scheme they had used with poor Outer Rim Worlds on both of the major galactic governments, and they were pretty successful at it. With that said, the IGBC also took its fair share of losses during the Clone Wars. The clan's neutrality didn't spare openly separatist banking clan worlds from Republic invasion, and Munilinst, Maigido, and eventually Scipio were subjected to devastating battles. Later in the war, the Republic got fed up with being beholden to the IGBC and nationalized parts of the banks, which significantly undercut the power of the banking clan. The worst blow came at the very end of the war, when the Republic became the Empire and the CIS was dismantled. Sand Hill and the rest of IGBC leadership was executed, and the clan lost an enormous amount of money during the collapse of the CIS. Like the other separatist mega corporations, the intergalactic banking clan was completely nationalized by the Empire, finishing what the Republic had started after the Battle of Scipio. But the IGBC was spared the fate of the other corporations, which were liquidated. The Empire feared that getting rid of the IGBC entirely would cause a recession because of how embedded in the economy it had become. Reluctantly, it allowed the IGBC to resume operations after the Clone Wars, albeit under Imperial purview. The Empire took steps to reduce the influence of the banking clan, but it could never completely excise the organization from the galactic economy, especially since the clan was still the primary backer for the galactic credit standard. Instead, the Empire settled for marginalizing the Muns themselves, stuffing the newly vacated upper ranks of IGBC leadership with humans loyal to the New Order. The Muns remained a powerful part of the banking clan, but they were deprived of total control, much to the chagrin of many on Munilinst. However, even as the Empire reigned in the IGBC, the bank steadily gained influence over the Empire. After the Battle of Endor, the Empire fragmented, and the IGBC suddenly became a powerhouse once more, controlling which warlords got the best financing. The IGBC threw most of its weight behind the Pentastar Alignment, a heavily armed Imperial Remnant that controlled the space around Munilinst, though it also financed other Imperial warlords and eventually the New Republic. The Pentastar Alignment ended up becoming the last major Imperial Remnant, but even at its weakest point, the Empire always retained control of Munilinst. This came at the cost of greater IGBC influence, of course. By the end of the Galactic Civil War, the Empire had been reduced to just eight sectors, all but one of which had originally been founded by the IGBC or its clients. The Remnant became just as beholden to the IGBC as the Republic and the CIS had been before. Well, that was a bit of a depressing story, wasn't it? It's good that banks don't have that much power in the real world, right? Anyway, what do you think? Would you like to see videos about some of the other corporations of the Separatist Council? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.